I think we're going to get with today's webinar, which I think is going to be a great one. Today's webinar is the RO, ROI is the true measurement of DevOps success. In fact, some may say ROI is the true measurement of success of anything we do in business. But certainly with DevOps, uh, you know, when we get to the bottom line, so to speak, ROI is where it counts. We have a tremendous panel lined up today. Uh, we have Dylan Silver from, uh, from Ansible, which is now, of course, part of Red Hat. Uh, we also have David Hayes and Eric Sigler of uh, PagerDuty. Eric is head of DevOps at PagerDuty, and David is director of platform strategy at PagerDuty. So, David, Eric, Dylan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's our sound check. We are <laughs> we're good to go. Okay, um, as I said, I think this is going to be a great webinar. Let's buckle in and we'll get started. Okay, great. Thank you. So we have a pretty straightforward agenda to talk about today. Obviously, we're going to um, we're going to talk about the impact of DevOps on ROI. We're going to talk about how it relates to the digital transformation that all businesses, or at least all successful businesses, are going through. Um, and then we're going to go through our cliches with great power comes great responsibility. And we're going to end on a high note that you can do it. Am I missing anything? No, sounds good to me. Okay, great. So let's talk about first uh, what PagerDuty does. And I like to start off by talking about the opposite of what PagerDuty does. So in far too many companies, uh, ops consists of uh, one person locked in a room with an unhealthy relationship with Nagios. So they're, they're monitoring hard drive uh, storage, they're monitoring network activity, but they're not really monitoring the business impact. And what we want to get to and what we're helping our customers get to is a world where it doesn't matter what tool detects the problem or what tool or what, or what tooling you need to remediate it, we want to bring that to the right person. So whether it's something inside the firewall or outside the firewall that detects that a particular service is down, we route it to the appropriate team and we help that team manage their escalation policies, their schedules. Um, and one thing that we're getting better and better at is instead of just being an alarm clock, we want to hand it to you on a silver platter. So instead of saying, this is broken, go fix it, it's, this is broken, here are some graphs. Um, you know, we're telling the chat room, we're, we're notifying your stakeholders. Uh, here's the conference call to join in. And we're going to get better and better at that. Plus page duty in a nutshell. What's Ansible? So Ansible, um, as a lot of people know, is a simple automation language that describes your whole environment from beginning to end of what you're trying to build and operate on a day-to-day -day basis. The Ansible at its core is the Ansible or is the automation engine that drives the playbooks to do this automation. You can provision instances, you can configure all the systems that have been provisioned then you can deploy your applications, and then finally you can orchestrate the monitoring for all of those systems. You can add them into PagerDuty after you have that monitoring set up. And then Tower is the framework that drives that automation completely forward and keeps it running continuously in the background. And it also provides an, an API that can be leveraged to do some orchestration based on alerts that come through from monitoring as well. So, um, next slide. Yeah, so it sounds like they go well together. Yeah, they go great together. Um, I myself, when I was in DevOps uh, practicing it day to day, I, uh, I actually wrote the PagerDuty module myself um, because we were big PagerDuty users. And uh, what this PagerDuty module does in a playbook is it creates maintenance windows. So if you're upgrading your application for any given reason and you have to have downtime, obviously you don't want to be alerting a whole bunch of people on a down service, so we put it in maintenance. So that's the first module you see. And then uh, the second module is, going back to my other um, example, if you're bringing up a new service and you need to create an alert within PagerDuty for that new service, uh, that module is there for you to use as well. Um, both of these are are valid playbook uh, snippets. So if you want to write your own playbook, here's an example to get started with. Cool, thanks. Very cool. Yeah, and so one of the things that we, we wanted to start off by talking about is, it's like my earlier example of not just monitoring hard drive usage, uh, 
I'm more on the business side of the business, and mm -hmm. you can tell me, oh, our 500s are up, or our 200, or our 400s are up, and I don't care. But if you tell me that we're failing at signups or we're failing at billing, right? That's much more uh, meaningful to me. So yeah. it's very important to think about what it is you want to measure, um, what you want to count. And I think actually there was a great example when you're talking about Ansible. If I'm upgrading something or if I'm in planned maintenance, which mm -hmm. uh, as a true DevOps company, PagerDuty does not have planned maintenance, but okay. Yep. You know, you don't want to be alerting, you don't want to be generating noise because it's not actionable. Right. Um, so that kind of brings us to talking about DevOps defined. And I believe this isn't contentious at all, so I'm no. going to let everyone read it. Yeah, it's, it's again, yeah, every, every discussion about DevOps ever has to start with trying to define it, and all of them end up having, you know, this is what I think the elephant looks like. Uh, but in essence, you know, I would say that DevOps is really, uh, you can define it many different ways, but it has a lot of elements of culture and uh, uh, culture and automation and measurement and sharing. Uh, and it works with a lot of different groups across the organization. Okay, and one of the, one of the things uh, internally that Eric and I disagree on a little <laughs> bit is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave his slide up and then say that define DevOps slightly differently in okay. that for me DevOps is about taking your ops team from a cost center to a competitive advantage. So if you are DevOpsing correctly your your uh, DevOps team should be deploying faster than your competition. Working off, you know, uh, feature requests that they got last year, whereas you're you've already deployed those. You're working on this year, and the the cost center part has been largely offloaded to uh, to AWS um, or or Azure or SoftLayer or Google Cloud Platform, and then your procurement office is able to handle uh, the cost center part of it and drive those costs down. Your DevOps team is able to focus on the future. Hopefully that doesn't disagree with your, uh, your your slide too much, Eric. Nope, nope, not too much. <laughs> Great. So let's talk about then the impact of, of DevOps on ROI. And I think that uh, I think I kind of spoiled the lead there by saying it's about uh, making yeah. sure you execute faster. Um, and I, it's so self-evident. I'm stumbling here. Yeah, no, it's, you know, I, I think about it too. You know, going back to the cost center bit about about IT or SREs or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. an ops person now, right? Mm -hmm. It boils down to one thing. If your ops people are maintaining a service consistently mm -hmm. and are in constant downtime or having to see why the service isn't running, a lot of times they aren't doing true DevOps as far as it's been coined because they are maintaining the system and are up hours into the night mm -hmm. worrying about, well, why is the service down or why are we having these 500 or 400s? That is money being spent on those engineers not moving forward. So I think what you said mm -hmm. about getting forward and, and releasing often is really the true approach because the faster they release, these SREs are going to be so much happier doing their mm -hmm. job and are going to produce a lot better and yeah. provide more meaningful impact to the company as a whole because they're not just the, the uh, button pushers to fix an issue or to restart a service or something like that, you know? Yeah. Um, so the, the ROI return right off the bat is huge because you aren't spending as much in downtime because <laughs> downtime equates to lost money and that's the true. lost service. Yeah, that's true. If you're down and you have competitors, which mm -hmm. you do, Right, yep. your competitors are eating your lunch while you're down. Downtime yep. doesn't matter. But uh, one of the things you said that I, I keep forgetting to mention when I'm, I'm doing this pitch is happiness does matter. Mm -hmm. Right, engineers mm -hmm. are not they're not easy to replace. Yep. And DevOps engineers, uh, we have the numbers to back this up, but it's also kind of self-evident are much happier. Yep. Like Eric's a great example of this uh, in that <laughs> he doesn't have to DevOps anything, but we can't we can't pull him out of it. Right, right? and you, yourself, you're still coding. Yep. Yep. One of, one of the other aspects of, of DevOps um, and ROI is also on the developer side, you just like the simplest way possible is if you think about code that hasn't shipped yet, that's like inventory, right? And the more code you have that hasn't shipped yet, you're waiting for that quarterly release or you're waiting for that two-week release, that's code that's sitting there not generating your business value. And so the less code you have that's not shipped, 
uh, the less code you have that hasn't gotten out and gotten, gotten in front of your customers, uh, again, the more value that you are able to provide back to your business. Again, yes, any true. Traction you want. The higher the blood pressure goes on your release manager, I think <laughs> we should include that as a feature. We should do uh, blood pressure monitoring on release managers and like mm. let you know where you, you are in the stack. Actually, but at some point, actually, though, it, it goes down again, though, right? And that's, again, getting to the different ways to measure ROI. The more you increase uh, your deployment rate, uh, the more you're exercising a lot of that tool chain, the lower your blood pressure is going to go, right? Because you're actually starting to um, basically not have as many, oh, that one thing didn't work the last time we tried it. You're getting rid of those kind of potholes. Mm-hmm. I think another measurement to think about as well in this place is culture and happiness coming together is you're going to have a culture of success with DevOps and practicing DevOps because your release manager is going to be happy. Your stakeholders at uh, exec level are going to be happy because you're releasing more often. Those engineers are going to be happy and devs are going to be happy. You're going to all be in this kumbaya moment that you're not fighting. <laughs> And I think that's ROI in of itself as well because, you know, just going back to the happiness bit, you're going to have a great culture because everybody's happy and getting along. That's true. In a lot of ways, happiness is a, is a lagging indicator, right? If, if everything's going well, people tend to be happy. Yep. So if they're happy, things are going well. Yep. And it's also worth noting the, the, the risk reduction, right? Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got essentially unsold, untested inventory, and we... We often gloss over all the huge improvements that have been made in sort of the median company's ability to deliver software, deliver tooling, mm -hmm. in that uh, you've got canary deploys, which are awesome. You've got the ability to have a staging environment or a, a load testing environment mm -hmm. that is essentially identical to production, yep. right? And you can spool those up and, and spool them down. Um, so the, the risk reduction is, is actually, it's already had, but there's, there's still a fair ways to go. Oh yeah, definitely. And then when you have great monitoring in place, too, um, in those staging environments, if they are built closer to production, you can start to gauge where issues may occur for a small subset of, of individuals if you're doing a canary deploy ahead of time and, um, and rapidly change that and, and advance forward on any issues that may occur, um, just creating more success at that point. Yeah, feel. that's true. One of the things to look out for, though, is monitoring has gotten so much better mm -hmm. and it is now it's really easy to panic yourself right yes. it's it's very easy to yes. see how many problems there are and you need to establish a baseline yep. and I think that the important thing is coming back to the ROI if you're waking somebody up you need to know how much money that's costing you, both yep. how much it costs to wake the person up yep. which is why we recommend um, basically pay for your on-call shifts so that you have uh, basically you've got something in the other call right mm -hmm. And it, you know the rate at which your engineers are comfortable trading shifts without keeping a detailed log of who owes who which days. Right. Um, but also, you need if you're going to alert on something, you should know this is costing us a thousand dollars a minute, yep. or it's costing us a dollar an hour. Something, something in there. Yeah. And taking a step back from uh, what Dave said, all of that aligns to, and and this is the part about measuring ROI. All of that aligns to what's important to your specific business. That's why there isn't really a great single set of this is the universal you know, ROI measures for this particular thing. It's kind of the same thing as uh, like lines of code, right? Nobody, everybody kind of understands that lines of code is not a good idea as a universal measure for uh, activity. Uh, and so you have to, when you're looking at metrics and looking at things that are like, okay, how are we figuring out if this DevOps thing is working out for us at all? You have to start with what's important to your business. Uh, and you have to basically kind of go from those those elements of what's important to your business back into the metrics. Uh, because as Hayes said, like every, now nowadays you have so much instrumentation across so many different parts of your infrastructure and you know Jira and Confluence, those things surface up uh, developer and operations tickets metrics things like that that you really you can pick any metric you want uh, and make the data say what you want so you have to really start from the place of what's important for your business absolutely yeah you need to you need to be able to calculate the R at a macro level and, and also to understand what your I is uh, at least at a macro level 
uh, actually one of the interesting things, one of the interesting problems in DevOps right now, uh, at least from my perspective, is uh, I don't know if we mentioned this or not, but Dylan and I are at VMworld right now, uh, so you can hear a little bit of background noise on our side. And Eric, you're at DevOps Days where? DevOps Day, uh, DevOps Day Chicago, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and so one of the things is there are so many great, really interesting tools out there, mm -hmm. and it's I want to use them all. Yep. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they're not the right decision? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, it turns out that's a, a little bit of overkill. Oh. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, so let me let me ask this to the rest of the panelists. How do you make the right decisions to improve your ROI if it's not throwing every tool you can find at a problem? Um, one one thing I would like to, to cover in that case is, and we glossed over it a little bit, is, is metrics. Kind of mm -hmm. have key metrics that help you identify what is valuable to you as, as a service provider or as a SaaS company or whatever you want to call yourselves. When you have those metrics defined, whether they be um, key API metrics that measure uptime or uh, how many logins that you get per minute or um, internal commits to code repositories or whatever, um, however you want to track those metrics, that will help you decide in a lot of cases what tools you want to use because you're starting to, defi to, to define a process internally mm -hmm. of how you want to approach things. And process is key to, to DevOps because if you don't have a process defined, you're just going to stumble all over yourselves. And um, in a lot of those cases where you start stumbling, you're going to rapidly choose these tools to fix a problem and you're going to come up with a hundred tools that do the same job yep. and not necessarily any of them do them the best way that it can be done. That's true. One of the one of the great things about the tooling has gotten a little bit more mature in that there used to be a time where you'd go to one large enterprise vendor and you mm -hmm. get you get your slate of tools. And some of them would be good, some of them would be yep. less than good. And now it's much easier, uh, especially if you're a page duty customer, i got to throw that plug in, to, uh -huh. to have different teams uh, using different tools yep. uh, and still get the visibility across the whole stack. Yeah. One of, one of the other things I would say on the right decisions for improving the ROI is also small and decrease the size of your iteration, right? Like you're going to, it, it's, the, it's the cycle, right, of pick a metric, do a thing, look at the metric and see if it changed and you want to decrease that time that it takes to do that cycle, right? So if one team is picking a tool, that's great. Okay, cool. You're going to go off and you're going to run with the newest shiny thing I can find from Hacker News. That's great. See you in two weeks. Did it make your life better or not? Instead of spending uh, six months or 12 months saying, well, we, we've now thrown so much energy into this tool that even though it's the wrong thing, we would all feel embarrassed about admitting it's the wrong thing, so we're just going to keep going. Decreasing the cycle time is important. So we should optimize for embarrassment. Yeah. Uh, optimize for fast embarrassment. That's true. If you're not embarrassed, you're probably not moving quickly enough. But I think the, the point there is to, to approach it from both sides, right? So there, there are a lot of great tools that you're probably not using and you should probably think about. But on the other side is what are the things that we're not able to do as a business? And how, who can help me solve those things? Or what are our competitors able to do that we're just not able to do? Mm -hmm. uh, which, which, uh, which sounds like a good segue into really what we're seeing is, is digital transformation. And this is, uh, this is possibly a little less contentious than, uh, than DevOps. But one thing that I like to, to think about digital transformation, which I grew up calling the paperless office, is, is more than just a paperless office. This is really, okay, everything's on a computer, right? We've, we've paid that penalty. It's now, you know, we, we have this tooling. But it's not about doing the same things more efficiently. It's not about, you know, spending slightly less on, on literally paper. It's about the way you can you can now use your information in new and exciting ways you couldn't before. So like a search first interface or the fact that you can now calculate your revenue today, right? Instead of getting a report at the end of the month, you now know today we were down for this or, or today we yep. gained this much money. And again, that's to some degree. It's it's about no. It's about starting to ask questions that you couldn't ask before with the old ways of doing something. Again, if you had the 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 paper report that you would get at the end of the month that told you how much money your business made, 
now you can have that metric live, what else can you do with it? Right? That's the that's the thing is that's like it enables new ways of approaching your business. Yeah, and, and we're definitely we're seeing that, right? It's not like if, if we look at these logos on the screen, these are not companies who are executing ten percent faster because yep. they're sending less money to Dunder Mifflin on you know paper and, and printer toner. They're actually operating in a completely different way to what we have the way they were working or the way these industries were working twenty years ago. That's Uber, great. Uber basically said, hey, every one of our customers or every one of our potential customers has a small computer in their pocket that has talk, that talks to a network. That's something that just wasn't possible before. What can we do with it? And it, that, that certainly causes uh, new and, and interesting challenges, right? Like in a traditional legacy cab company, you would have a human being who, was, who would read these things and were in charge of error handling. Uber uh, has too small a window, and their 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 users are very demanding. They don't have the ability for a human to step in. Um, or I guess they, they almost certainly do at like higher levels, but at scale, it just doesn't make sense for a human being to be involved in every operation. And getting to the the metrics and pick metric that matters for your business's ROI. Uh, some companies may say, "Hey, you know," uh, and I've I've worked with some where it says five hundreds or or errors from the site. We want those to be like 0.01% or something, right? Uber, though, for parts of their API, they said any time that we serve back a, a failed request, that's a, that's a potential lost uh, revenue opportunity because the window of opportunity is so short that they can't say, well, you know, yeah, 1% 500s is fine. They can't make those kinds of decisions, and so they back that back to this is what's important to our business, okay, that metric is now the one we're going to watch like a hawk and hook up to all of our monitoring tools and all of our reporting tools. I think one thing to quickly mention about these, these four and, and plenty of others out there is not every single one of them operate 100% the same way. There really isn't a silver bullet to how to do DevOps. But one thing to definitely mention for all of these guys specifically is they definitely do deliver fast and they deliver often. And they also are all internally very aware of what's going on with their company at any given time. Mm -hmm. And they're all true stakeholders within mm -hmm. the companies themselves. So just that realm of, of uh, concern internally has enabled them to be the, the forefathers, so to speak, of, of true DevOps in a lot of cases. Yeah, and it's Netflix... Um I love Netflix. I, I signed up the day they came to Canada, and I will be a customer for the rest of my life. And they, they take it very seriously, right? Yeah. The, uh, the, a lot of the, the page duty pages that they're sending out are not a customer is affected. It's we ran this, this test scenario, and mm -hmm. your code was unable. Uh, right? They're, they're, there's Chaos Monkey and there's Simeon Army. Yeah. It runs essentially, I guess, the reverse of Canary deploys. Like, if this broke, would your, your software be able to handle it? Um, they take it very seriously. Um, which so guys, hey guys, this is Alan. Yep. I, I just wanted to ask, ask the three of you, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are four great examples of DevOps-enabled companies that you have singled out. And, you know, in prior webinars, I think we've looked at all four of these as well. But at mm -hmm. the end of the day, the, these, these four companies are really unicorns, right? In that they're cloud-native, mm -hmm. you know, built built with, you know, in the era of DevOps, we have a couple of hundred people listening in who all don't have the luxury of working in a greenfield cloud native uh, environment, but yet DevOps is just as important to them, right? Mm -hmm. And if we could spend, and I don't want to take us too much out of our flow, but just mm -hmm. a moment on how we take the success of these unicorns and apply them to, as Gene Kim calls them, horses. <laughs> oh yeah, Thanks, no. Sir. By all means, I, we're here for, for this audience, and uh, I think you're right. That would be valuable, and I think that you can you can definitely implement some of the the highest ROI, if you will, practices. So um, internally at PagerDuty, we basically took Failure Friday from Netflix. Rather than having an automated Simeon army uh, randomly pulling out wires, what we do is uh, once a week we pick a service, um, we pick Basically, we have a list of what are the things that keep us awake at night. 
and we sit down in a room with all the relevant engineers, and we make that bad thing happen. Um, and everybody's prepared. We're, we're ready to flip the switch if anything goes wrong. And that's something that anybody could start doing today. Right? If you're listening to this and you have something you're concerned about that you, you don't think your service uh, could survive, even if you're, you're still mailing out a CD-ROM, right? okay, set some time aside and deal with that problem. Or test that. Test that uh, scariness. Sorry, not deal with that problem. <laughs> uh, another thing that you can do, you're, you're almost certainly migrating something from something. Uh, and so a lot, what a lot of these great companies are doing is they understand their monitoring. So if you make sure that the monitoring against what you're migrating uh, to and from are both being piped into PagerDuty, and you, you basically want to be in a situation where you're changing things uh, confidently, that if anything breaks on the legacy system or the new system, uh, everybody's informed about it. Those are the two off the top of my head. Yeah, one, one that I would say right off the bat, too, is uh, don't be afraid to talk to each other. Um, I know in, in a lot of cases, uh, Dev individuals and operations individuals may not see eye to eye, but that shouldn't stop you from at least discussing um, what your goals are internally. If you're on the same page, you're going to be able to help identify within, within your teams how to move forward quicker. Um, and, and be humble. We've, we've touched about uh, humility a little bit here. Um, ever being so humble somebody else has an idea that you may not have thought of and take that to heart and run with it because you're just going to be that much more successful when you start discussing within yourselves yeah definitely we i would, I would say i was going to say uh, one one specific thing that any company can do is automation and it goes right to, to dylan's point the the point is Pick something and automate it, whether it's provisioning your infrastructure, provisioning a server, or deploying your application, or making the image that is pressed onto those CD-ROMs. Automate it. But to Dylan's point, be taken ideas from everyone. You know, it, it shouldn't be the release team, the release engineering team is going to go operate, uh, automate this. It should be, hey, let's let's figure out what we want to do and just automate it and be humble and talk with everybody about it. Oh, you're, uh, you know, the, the operations team says this software is packaged in a really unpleasant way that we can't automate very easily. Go talk with the developers. Ask the question, why was it packaged that way? Oh, can we package it this other way? Okay, let's work together on that. And automation exposes all of these things as opportunities for any company of any size or any maturity level to work on. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that both what Dylan and Eric said points to sort of our, our, our next point, that you want authority and responsibility to reside in the same person and the person who's most invested in the outcome. So when, when Eric says automation, if somebody's job is literally you know, uh, running a, a day-long manual deploy process, you need to, they've got the responsibility, you need to give them the authority to automate uh, the, the repeatable parts of the process, which makes it both reliable, uh, which reduces your risk, but it also makes it far more efficient. Right? And to, to Dylan's point, um, if somebody has the authority, they need to accept the responsibility. Yep. Well, and then, you know, to, to build off the automation bit of that, if mm -hmm. you are automating, you're, you're gaining money right there. Because yep. that one person who is spending a whole day clicking a button and, and doing a manual deploy process, once they have it automated, they can go and do something else now. That's true, yeah. And, and that's, mm -hmm. that's the beauty of, of tools like, like Ansible or the others out there. We enable that automation because um, this is the one thing I've always thought about Ansible being a practitioner of it is I'm replacing me with a tool and stepping back and letting it do it. Um, and I've taken yeah. responsibility for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. The, I will replace myself with a small shell script. Uh, punchline. Yep. <laughs> so I, I've seen you at work, Eric, and I, I realize how small your shell script would actually be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, beyond that, you did hire smart people, right? Mm -hmm. They're there because they're invested in your business success, right? They they understand some aspect of your business. This is one thing that, that always gets to me, um, both in product but in business in general. Like you are right now building the world leading experts on how to build what it is you're building. Right, whether someone's been there for six days or six years, they know something that 
that nobody else on earth knows about how to make your business successful. Um, and that thing is almost certainly not following, you know, a printout of what, what shell commands to run. Yep. Uh, one thing also on the on the automation and getting back to the, or getting to the individual contributor level, automation does not like put you out of a job. You know, we joke. We the joke is that you know you automating yourself out of a job, but that's not the case. There's always a new problem to solve, and the more that you spent time thinking about the problems for your business that you need to solve, uh, the more domain knowledge you can apply to the next problem. Uh, you know, we talk about release engineering, and oh well. The, the new hotness is things like serverless uh, computing and AWS Lambda. I just sat in a uh, DevOps Days presentation about building the tooling that doesn't exist yet for almost anybody to deploy code and to do things with AWS Lambda. So there's always a new problem to solve. That's true. And one of the things that, one of the people part of the problem is that you, I mean, you're there to make the business decisions, whether those are high level CEO decisions about acquisitions or whether those are about uh, what deploy tool to use on AWS. Computers are, are awful at this kind of thing. Like one of the things that, one of the examples I love to use is right now at your house, there's a computer that thinks the most important thing for you to do is to apply an Adobe Acrobat update, right? And you know, you know you've got more important things to do than that. So guys, Alan Schimmel here again. If you're a security guy, you might think that Adobe Acrobat update's pretty important, or your latest iPhone update that they were yelling about this past week with exploitations in the wild. I, I guess the, the point is prioritization is in the eye of the beholder, right? And that, yep, and that gets back to the the having to have a culture and having to have communication across the teams so that everybody has this kind of shared context of, oh, okay, you think this is important? Well, I think that's important. How do we get together? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, and I think security engineers, um, they, should, they should be definitely involved in these processes. They sometimes like to sit off on their own or others are, are very brash. Um, what it boils down to is you're all there for the same reason. And that reason is success of your company. If a security engineer is involved in the process for release, they can get what they need in at a release schedule and be a part of that sprint. Mm -hmm. And there they are. They're a part of the culture. They're a part of that success chain in release. Um, there's multiple ways that you can definitely skim that cap for sure. Yeah, absolutely right. Like it comes from a person, right? So I. I I think I've outed myself as horrible at doing my, my mandatory updates, but periodically somebody from our, our ops team will come over and tell me, we're doing two-factor authentication. You've got you've got to shape up or shape out, basically. Right? You trust the people. People understand the business cases. They're, I mean, they're also able to handle, right? I can't think of a, an ex exception uh, in a security case, mm -hmm. but right, there are, you know, if, even if we put in a business logic, actually, there was a great example at the beginning, right? If the server is not responding, somebody should fix it. But what if I'm doing an upgrade? What if I know that this has a, you know, this is patch Tuesday or whatever, and I know that I'm expecting this outage and I'm watching it. Humans are able to deal with that and match it up to the goals. Well, and then, you know, from a, a human perspective too, if, if, you know, going back to automation, if you have automation in place and we're talking about patching here, if you have a defined process of these patches are going to be released every Tuesday and we're going to apply these patches every Wednesday, everybody's aware of that and people will schedule around that requirement. Um, humans are malleable. We know what to do and when to do it. As long as that discussion is being had and you allow automation to do a lot of those things for you, you can focus on those things that mean much more to the company. Yeah. If something always needs to happen, yep. have a computer do it. If somebody needs to think about it, people. And, and we, we, uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, and these are there's a lot of different tools that you can use to arm the the humans to do the right thing, right? And that's what you were talking about earlier, uh, Hayes, is the canary the canary deployments. Uh, auto, you know, automatic rollbacks if a metric has tripped that's like, hey, we, we have too many 500s. Uh, and those are all things that, again, are there ways to 
automatically or programmatically uh, reduce the risk of changes that are happening to your business. Because again, you're hopefully rolling new changes out very, very quickly. Yeah, it's true. And it's up to the people to measure the, the risk versus the cost, right? So yep. maybe you don't have a Canary uh, server yet. Um, you probably should. But rolling back a Canary deploy is easier than rolling back a uh, deploy across the whole system, which is itself easier than falling back to uh, another data center, right? So there's two ways you can look at it. One is there might be uh, metrics you can gather that force one of these, these changes, right? So it's entirely possible that you could come up with metrics that would, with confidence, allow you to fail back to another data center, even if you know that means the entire ops team is now working the weekend to you know, to move everything back to the primary and to, you know, fiddle some switches, whatever it is ops team will do. Or you might need the person in the loop, right? Okay, this looks bad. I'm going to make the call. Yeah, and, and hopefully you, you're you're starting to think about leverage, uh, leveraging automation tools like Ansible to, to help you do those processes because most of these deployments are repeatable. Most rollbacks are de repeatable as well. And to de-risk yourselves, um, is to apply that automation strategy across the board. Um, it could be as simple as just restarting the service. That all can be done with automation languages, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, which kind of leads into essentially our last point, which is we're not, DevOps, even though it's new and exciting, it's not risky. This is, the status quo is risky. Making mm -hmm. your systems anti-fragile is the way you should be looking at it. Failing to move quickly is a risk. Yep. Well, you, and that's because in part the world's changing whether you want it to or not. You know, you, you, are, you can't lock down and not have any change. You could lock down your whole infrastructure, right, and say, we're never, we're never going to deploy another thing again. We're never going to change operating. We're just going to run everything until the end of time. And then tomorrow, somebody's going to fit, find out a new zero-day vulnerability for SSL. Uh, and now all of a sudden, whether you wanted to change or not, you're going to have to. That's true. You have to change on somebody else's timeline. If you're deploying yep. 100 times a day, a security patch is not scary. If, you're, if your release manager needs three days to put something out and you need to do it today, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to break things. Yep. And, and, you know, one thing, too, when, when it comes to uh, deployments and automation, we're by no means suggesting everybody should have access to all systems. There are ways around that. Um, we uh, at Ansible, we obviously provide a tool to ops individuals to provide indirect access to systems. Um, there are other ways that you could do that to meet and satisfy uh, those requirements, uh, whether they're PCI requirements or uh, SOX compliance issues that you may have to face. Um, just think that there are ways to to enable that now, um, and you don't have to give carte blanche access to everything on your system. Actually, that's that's a great thing that came out with the digital transformation. Yeah. So I'm I'm a bit of a weird duck at uh, platypus, if you will, at pager duty. But my credentials are specified by somebody who's in this group and this group and this group, right? Mm -hmm. If we were mani manually uh, managing those, we'd be dangerously close to flip that schmod seven 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 switch on me yep. uh, and open up a, a window. And that's uh, the the part of the accessing and part of because I I think I I think I've actually pushed some of those changes to remove some of your access, Dave. Uh, it, part of it is you get an automate you get a uh, uh, an audit chain, right? And that's oftentimes what you need with security practices. Is it's not just a question of who has access to what, but can we see what they did? And again, the more more tooling you have around that, the better it gets. Absolutely, yeah. If if somebody in enterprise is afraid. Uh, if your boss is afraid of the shift to, to, shift to DevOps, uh, have them talk to us. We'll talk them off that ledge. <laughs> because I think the, the big thing is that, I mean, computers are hard. Computers are scary, at least to me. Uh, but DevOps really allows your management to focus on increasing what they want to work on, right? Like, security is just table stakes now. Uh, automation is table stakes. Speed is table stakes. Um, but which, where you place your, your expensive investments, that still needs a lot of thought. And I think one, one of the other aspects uh, kind of going to this, this slide and this point is now that you've done, you know, 
no matter what size organization you are, no matter what level of maturity you're at in terms of how much you DevOps, uh, once you start to do these things and individual contributors start to get empowered with, hey, I have the ability to push to production or I have the ability to tell the robot to go push to production and it records and audit trails me. Now that those individual contributors have more uh, ability to directly do their own work, that actually is really great as management because uh, I've been on both sides of this equation, right? And it's really great for management because now you are freed up from, oh, I have to go chase down security because my entire team is blocked from pushing for two weeks because they don't have uh, the right uh, review of their code to, hey, my team is off and running. I can now find out what I can do to improve my team's performance, my team's ability to get things done. Absolutely, yeah, and we're all about getting things done. Yep. Great, I. Yeah. That, no. yeah, I think I think I'm ready for questions. Yeah. Great, guys. Hey, I, I, guys, I thought that was an excellent overview, and, and you guys being at VMworld and and DevOps days, it lends a little bit of that show uh, adrenaline, if you will, where you know having as I was talking before. Having just returned from DevOps Days Boston myself, it's always exhilarating to talk to real people who are doing DevOps, questions about DevOps, presenting about DevOps, and it kind of makes you really appreciate, you know, some of the things we take for granted. It's it's a great time to be alive. If you're a software developer, if you're in IT, there's just so much great stuff going on. Um, but with that said, let's let's jump to some questions here. We have a few. So our first question comes from Mark Ellaby, and it's, when doing assessments with teams or organizations, what do you see as the key collateral or assets to having a DevOps toolkit? Um, you know what? Uh, why don't we start off perhaps with uh, Eric mm -hmm. on that one. Key assessments or collateral in a toolkit. Um, yeah. And again, I'll, I'll kind of start back with the, the point earlier that those assessments are going to depend somewhat on your company's values and on what's important to your business. Um, so at PagerDuty, uh, we have a, a particular, you know, obviously we want to make sure that we deliver uh, our alerts on time, that we have an internal uh, sort of like a, an SLA, that we want to make sure that this service is moving things forward to the next service. So for us, we kind of start from there and go, okay, is this pipeline getting better or worse? Uh, and so that kind of you know, relates the business need to the specific metric. Uh, so as an assessment, yeah, I think that's the, the key thing is also another important part of it is it's not a one-time assessment. Uh, you shouldn't just start out and say, okay, these are my metrics, I'm done. Uh, it should be a kind of a constant process of, okay, these are the metrics we're going to worry about this week or this quarter. And, you know, you can take a little bit more of an infrequent basis to review those metrics, but it's important not to just set them and forget them. Okay. Uh, before we go to the next question, though, I wanted to give our other panelists, because that, that's a, this is a pretty meaty question. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else? Dave or Dylan, any Thoughts, comments? Um, one thing I, w I would say really quickly is uh, measure against your company values. Um, if you use your values as a key metric to measure against, um, whether those values are as simple as like ours, which are be kind, be accountable, be open, um, there, there are ways to elaborate on those and measure against it. Um, I, I, that, that's what we did at a place I worked at two jobs ago, um, and I, I felt even more successful in making decisions and becoming a DevOps organization and a DevOps engineer by following those values. Excellent. Anyone else? Uh, as the only other one else, no, I, I think that's a good answer. <laughs> yep. I, I, I just want to add a couple of things. You know, so first of all, don't underestimate some of the great books that are out there around 
building DevOps teams and things that can help you. One that comes to mind is Gary Groover's book called Leading the Transformation. It's a short, easy read, but it's the kind of thing you could go back to. And, and, and he has some good metrics and some good ideas and collateral on there. The other thing is, guys, I, you know, we've been in this dev, DevOps has been around now a couple of years as DevOps, right? And, and we're seeing the market and, and the kind of best practices, emerging practices come, come to be. And, and, you know, they're solidifying around certain tool sets and toolkits, if you will. And I think we're going to hear more about that in the coming weeks and months. You're going to, I think you're going to start seeing some of the DevOps tools come together in terms of interoperability and helping automation. But uh, it'll be something to watch for. Anyway, let's move on to another question. And this is from Juan Garzon. If I mispronounce names, of course, I apologize. Uh, will, would it be possible to get a copy of the presentation? Fooled me. Wrong one. Yes, Juan, we, we are recording this, and it'll be up on YouTube along with the slides and everything else. Um, here's a great one. Do you have a productivity measure? This is from Brett Span Spangenberg. So do you have a measure for productivity? Dave, anything? Um, I'm going to boldly say lines of code now that Eric can't hit me. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> we're we're going to talk about that later. So he who has the most code wins, is that it? I believe so, yeah. Uh, but what happens if I remove code and things get better? Exactly. I will, I will push back on Dave's lines of code, and I will say that uh, a pretty good metric for us and, and a lot of organizations is how long something takes to happen. Uh, for us, uh, we, uh, we looked at, uh, at PagerDuty, we had about a year or two's worth of data on pull requests. So we were able to say, hey, we, pull requests should not take two weeks to stay open. They should be uh, code reviews or pull requests, what have you. They should take less than a week. You know, like, and how can we decrease that number and track it over time? Uh, and again, you have to be a little careful because think like an economist. You don't want to incentivize the wrong behavior. Uh, so we had to, for the first year that the management was looking at uh, pull request open time, we didn't tell anybody. Uh, because we didn't want to incentivize people to just open and close pull requests real quick. Um, but that's the sort of thing where you can find a metric that's a reflection of what's actually happening and then watch it over time. Because usually the, the second derivative, what is it doing over time, is really the, the interesting thing. Yeah, and Got so it. my actual answer to that question is the, the productivity metric I like to uh, track for DevOps is the, um, the average time of a new employee especially an entry-level employee, until they deploy code to production. It's almost impossible to fake that mm -hmm. metric. Right? Yep. It requires that all of your testing has to be good, all of your deploys, um, yep. your on-call rotation. You have, to be com you have to be comfortable in your system to have an intern deploy code on their first day, if you can do it. But first week is still, is still pretty impressive. And some might think that this is harsh, but you could also use whatever service it is that they're writing, uh, the monitoring API, um, metrics for that service could be tied to their individual um, performance as well. Uh, some of those big companies actually do that. Um, each individual's up for their service, um, and you can measure that if you're monitoring properly. Yep, okay. I think that's good, yeah. Okay, let's, if, if no one else, I'm going to move on to the next, uh, move on to the next question. We okay? Mm-hmm. Okie dokie. Um, our next question, sorry, um, okay, it's a little longer. Do you think that meaningful measures are a good way to demonstrate part of the results of adopting, of adopting DevOps? Any other suggestions? So let me, let me field that one as probably the less technical savvy of, of the three of us. If you can't show me numbers, you didn't do anything. I'm comfortable saying that, right? Whether it's, uh, so Eric's measure pull requests um, coming up, like I can understand that's velocity. Uh, whether it's my measure, whether it's um, downtime, uh, even if it's employee satisfaction, even if you don't, even if the, it's not the final word, your metric, if you don't have a metric, uh, I don't believe you did anything. 
I'm awful, aren't I? Mm, no, I, I agree with it, so I must be awful too. <laughs> Do we want to make it unanimous? I, yeah, I was trying to think, like, I do think there is, and this goes all the way back to the quote at the very beginning, there are things that count that can't be counted, um, and, you know, I often have arguments with others about this, this is important, but there's no direct metric that shows with it, but I can usually find a secondary metric or something that will reflect the end state, because, again, you're hopefully making the business better, something else better, and there should always be some metric at the end that you can point to. So, guys, I'm... I I'm reminded of something I learned from a fellow named Brad Felt. I had sold a company to Brad many years ago, and Brad's a very successful VC. And he always tells me that everything can be measured, and we measure everything. Um, and I think, to a certain extent, when it comes to business, that if it's something that's not measurable, I just you have a tough time proving um, yeah. value. And my two cents on it. Um, so here's an interesting question. Can you identify, if any, the limitations of ROI in DevOps? That's a tough one. Eric, would you like to go first? So the limitations of ROI in DevOps, I would say you're, at the end, you, a lot of DevOps comes from uh, ideas in Agile and in XP and Extreme Programming, and that kind of goes all the way back to things like lean manufacturing. So at some point, you're really trying to optimize the efficiency of the system. In this case, the system happens to be the humans that are doing things that make your business money. Uh, so at some point, you are going to have like diminishing returns on the practices that you're trying. Uh, hey, let's deploy every 30 seconds or something. Like There will probably be some point of absurdity but overall, the idea of DevOps is that it's increasing your efficiency across your entire organization. Uh, so there's probably only the limits of that overall increasing of the efficiency, right? Like there's things you could do that just wouldn't, we're gonna spend a year building a, the world's perfect deployment system and it meets all of our efficiency goals. That may not be the most important thing for your business to do. Got it. Guys, any else, anybody else wanna chime in on that one? Yeah, so one important thing that's really hard to measure is risk reduction, right? Mm -hmm. Like, let's say you, you put in uh, new mitigation against the type of security risk, and you, you didn't suffer one of those attacks, right? How, how do you justify whether or not you made the right decision? Yep, fair enough. All right, if, if, let's move on to our next question then. This is an interesting one from Yomi. Uh, leaders in large organizations are always looking at ways to reduce costs and they sometimes consider DevOps as a practice to help achieve this through reducing employees or dollar saves. What is your experience? So DevOps is the efficiency experts. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Dave, you wanted to go first on this one? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'll be the bad guy. You, if you don't have high value things for your people to be doing, uh, you need to address that as a business. Right. Every time we've freed somebody up because of automation, uh, some of the things that, that Eric referred to actually freed human beings up, we were able to find great new things that we weren't getting to. Right. If you've got more problems than you've got, or if you've got, if you don't have anything that you need getting done, um, well, it's a less exciting place to be. But I, I haven't talked to many customers who do that. People are smart. There's a lot of great things for them to be doing. To build off of that, if, if, if you've done everything, that means you guys are at a point where you can do more, build more products, exactly. you know, um, make it exciting again. Um, there, in most cases, though, there isn't always perfection. There's probably something hidden in the closet somewhere that you need to address and spend some time finding that one little problem. I mean, there, there are multiple routes that you can take at that, at that rate. That's true. I mean, if, if you as a business have gotten to the point where you've automated all your people, those people have lucrative speaking engagements waiting for them. I uh, tell <laughs> the rest of us how that happened. Yeah. You know what? The guys at Net, Netflix, for sure. Um, so here, you know, and I'm speaking now as a 
executive and I've owned multiple businesses. I think the whole allure of DevOps is exactly that. It's not that it's reducing employees per se, but it certainly is being more efficient. And anytime you're more efficient, you're saving dollars, right? Yeah. So if I could free up my skilled employees from doing rather mundane tasks because I automate them with DevOps and CD and so forth, and allow them to concentrate on higher higher payback, if you will, higher, you know, bang for the buck type of activities, it, that's a win for me as a business owner, as an executive. And I, I think nowhere is that more true than in QA, right? If we could automate mundane tasks so that we, the tasks that my QA people are actually running are real high value, very highly customized, that's a win. Um, so, I, you know, do you want to say that that may reduce employees? I don't think that's the case. I think most companies, if you're if you're a talented employee, they're not looking to get rid of you. Not not you know not with those kinds of skills in today's market. I, I don't know how, if you guys feel differently. Yeah, because those people have the the domain knowledge, right? Everybody in your business knows something, and so if you can free them up to improve your business and take away the mundane tasks, your business will improve. Mm-hmm. I, I I think that kind of is the gist of it. So I, I don't look at DevOps as the you know the job killer. I think it's actually a job creator, net net. But you know, perception sometimes is perceptions are sometimes reality with people. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes um, sometimes people do say, "Hey, I'm just going to have my ops person do Dev now." It's like, no, that's not that's not what it means. <laughs> no, no. Well, or they have their Dev person do ops, and I'm sure yep, every Dev yep. person is. Cringing, um, but that's probably a great segue to another webinar we'll do someday about should your dev person be doing ops. Uh, we we have this funny T-shirt we give away at some of the shows we do where it says "sys admins" because even developers need heroes, and that always that always gets a you know gets people going. Uh, anyway, guys, we're almost at the top of the hour here. And I'm going to have to pull the plug on this one. But before we do, I first of all wanted to thank um, Pager Duty for sponsoring. David, Eric, Dylan, thanks for doing a great job on today's presentation. I love webinars that are more truly uh, panels like this rather than three different monologues. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you guys did a great job. I think you made it very interesting for the audience, and I'm sure they appreciated it. Thank you for everyone who asked questions as well. Always makes for a better webinar. Um, with that thank being you, said, though, thank you guys. Until next time then, this is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com. Have a great day, and we hope to see you at another DevOps.com webinar soon. Take care now. Bye-bye.